This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio, episode 724. This week, we welcome Dr. Martin Chapman, the president of Indoor Biotechnologies, We're going to talk about allergens and IEQ. I think this is an underappreciated area of indoor environments. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at restorationindustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA, at eia-usa.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are Particles Plus, at particlesplus.com. BioPlanet, at byoplanet.com. Actionable Insights, at getinsights.org. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio trivia question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report there was... No correct answer to last week's trivia question. No one identified 1922 as the year the American Society of Heating, Ventilation, Engineers, ASHV, published its first heating and ventilation guide. And actually, ASHV was the predecessor of what is now ASHRAE. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. What are the four types of common allergens? Back to you, Joe. Okay, Dr. Martin Chapman is a leading scientist and entrepreneur in the field of allergy. He received his PhD in immunology in 1981 from the Royal Postgraduate Medical School at the University of London, following his postdoctoral fellowships at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and at the UCLA School of Medicine. He was appointed to the faculty of the University of Virginia in 1985, became a tenured professor of medicine and microbiology. In 2001, he moved from UVA to become the president and CEO of InBio, formerly Indoor Biotechnologies, Inc., the company that he founded in 1997. Welcome back, Dr. Chapman. Hey, Joe. It's great to be back. It's been a while, huh? Uh, longer than I realized. I think 16 <laughs> years or at least 12. I don't. I, it's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. Time well, flies when you're having fun. That's right, and things are moving on, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So... Speaking of things moving on, what's kind of let's let's get a little update on the whole allergen area. You know, we we did a show with you well back, and um, I'm just curious, uh, what kind of new things are happening in the allergen front? Um, the major thing, actually, since then, we we've done a, we've developed new technology. So it it used to be that we would just run ELISA assays for one or two allergens on samples. And since that time, we've developed what's called multiplex technology, which has the ac- acronym MARIA, which is multiplex array for indoor allergens. And essentially that what this means is that we can go into a home or an office or workplace and uh, take a dust sampler or an air sample and essentially measure the vast majority of the allergens in one test. And so that is a huge advantage Um especially if you're involved, as we often are, in studies of hundreds uh, of samples. Um, um, we do a lot of studies with the NIH and, and other government agencies uh, looking at uh, allergen exposure in relation to asthma. And so for those in those circumstances, we, we can literally get thousands and thousands of data points just by virtue of the fact that we can analyze everything all at once, which is a great advantage. So how many allergens are you typically looking at with 
with, uh, it's, with, it's, it's usually a kind of version of what in the food allergy industry is called the big eight. I mean, it's dust mites. We measure one or two allergens there. Um, cat, dog, cockroach. We measure a couple of cockroach allergens. For uh, occupational um, laboratory animal allergy, we measure mouse and rat. Um, and typically, we might measure one or two moles like alternaria, for example. Although I, I say the vast majority of our testing is is um, is is related to all those allergens, probably except the molds, because those are, are more difficult to detect in the environment. And let's let's talk a little bit about some of the current recommendations for allergens in indoor environments. I think this is important and an important update. Um, Grayson, if you could pull up slide two, we can talk a little bit about this with Dr. Chapman. What what kind of new things are happening or, or current? What are the more current recommendations for allergens in the indoor environment? Well, let me just back up a little bit for for for, for your for your audience and to say that um, um, why do we think you know the main reason for looking at allergens in homes is because they cause allergic diseases um, and primarily we're the disease that we're, we're most interested in is asthma. Uh, because it's a severe allergic disease, it, it's often responsible for emergency room admissions. Um, roughly one in 10 children um, is asthmatic, and about 70 to 80% of those will be allergic to either indoor allergens, which is dust mites, cat, dog, cockroach. Um, some are also allergic to pollens, and they get what, what's called seasonal allergy. So if you look at the costs of emergency room admissions, I was actually looking yesterday at data from Florida, it's costing $400, $400 million a year just in Florida alone. And so the, the estimated economic costs of asthma are of the tune of 50 billion, and that's sort of CDC information. And so, you know, what we think is going on is that children become sensitized at an early age, um, they then develop allergic antibody responses, which which can cause inflammation in the lungs. But once that happens, those those the, those sensitive hypersensitive lungs can be triggered by other things, and so they can be triggered by air pollution, for example. And you often hear a lot more about these days about air pollution than about indoor allergen in causing asthma. Also viruses. So when kids go to school, particularly in September, October, they've had the summer off. All these viruses can also trigger asthma attacks. And so that's a real, you know, the clinical reason why we're really interested in this. Now, um, a couple of years ago, um, um, there's a national asthma education and prevention program. And that, that working group studies what are the effective treatments that we can recommend for asthma. Uh, so they'll look at, for example, inhaled corticosteroid drugs or other kinds of drugs. And one of the components was um, 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 what we can do for indoor allergen mitigation. And in fact, they, they start that out by saying that the environmental control is one of the cornerstones of asthma management. Um, so it's important. What they recommend are um, um, multi-component um, targeted interventions that are targeted specific allergens. So for example, if you're dust mite allergic, they're going to recommend putting mattress encasings on your beds. They're going to recommend reducing humidity uh, because that kills the dust mites. Um, if you're cockroach, allergic, then it's sort of integrated pest management comes into play. And the same if you're in an in inner city home, and a lot of inner city homes um, and low income homes have mice, um, mouse infestation. Um, and I'll show you data later from schools in the, in the, the northeastern uh, US where mouse is also prevalent in schools. And um, so for those, you look at in integrated pest management. Um, and for things like um, more airborne allergens like cat and dog, you can use air cleaners, that type of thing. So those are the basic recommendations um, 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 of, of this particular group, um, which I think is important. Um, so um, um, shall we go to the next slide? Well, let me, let me ask a follow yeah. up here because yeah, I, sure. I, I was watching a webinar yesterday. EPA had a webinar with some folks from out in uh, Kansas City area, Children's Mercy Hospital, and uh -huh. uh, Kevin Kennedy was on with a couple of other people, and they were they were talking uh, about um, weatherization, and then they were kind of 
overlaying the data on weatherization projects and children who go to Children's Mercy and other hospitals for allergies and, uh, you know, asthma related events. And um, basically the, 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 it appears that weatherization helps with that, maybe not specifically geared towards stopping allergies, but I'm, I'm wondering what else do you see being done as far as like, you know, the cleanup of allergens after, um, you know, you find someone's allergic to dust mite or, let's say mouse, because I think that's a good one. Is there much being done on whether or not going in and actually cleaning that helps as opposed to other interventions? Yeah, there, there have been one or two studies. There was a recent one a year or two ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association on cleanup, um, which actually was surprising because it didn't re result in a huge improvement in lung function in the asthma patients. Um, and so I think there was an editorial about that too. And it was suggesting that there might be other potential factors involved with that. And, and the problem with asthma is that it really is a multifactorial disease. Um, it's related, you know, the, the, the symptomatology and everything is based on how much you're exposed to. Um, sometimes it can also, there can be genetic factors that play into it, as well as other environmental things. So it's really hard to actually do the proper controlled environmental uh, allergen avoidance studies, largely because when you're talking to these patients and, and enrolling them, it's very hard not to purvey what the what a little bit about what the study is about. And what, what you find when you do those studies is that there's quite a lot of people who don't get that who get the placebo um, information. But on the other hand, they know they're involved in this kind of study, so they'll do a lot of cleanup work themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the problem, and it has been a problem for, uh, for setting up these studies. I think the other aspect to it is that um, if you compare, you know, the tons and tons of studies showing at looking at what, where pe what people are allergic to, and um, uh, uh, in, and um, uh, and that in relation to asthma, but there are very very few studies, more fewer studies, let's say, met by a factor of maybe ten or even a hundred, on doing the actual avoidance procedures. Um, and I, I'll, I have some a slide on that which I can show in a second. But it just emphasizes the issue that um, when you're trying to do what's called evidence based medicine, it's particularly difficult to set up these studies. Let me ask another quick follow-up. You, yeah, you yeah. mentioned that, you know, with mouse and cockroach, they want to use integrated pest management, which stops or slows down the growth of whatever infestation mm -hmm. there is. Do the allergens produced by that mouse droppings or whatever, do they become less um, potent over time? I don't know if that's the right terminology to use. I uh, know. I mean, they hang around. And I mean, you you know, that's one of the issues is that you, you don't have problems in finding allergens in dust. And, you know, we know from years ago, um, Bob Wood at Johns Hopkins did a, a, a pretty seminal study where he tried to clean up a ha houses and to get rid of cat allergen, for example. And in some cases, it took him nine months. Uh, the, to actually get the allergen levels down. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't a straight, you know, people at that time, the advice was for, from allergists was, well, get rid of the cat, but getting rid of the cat didn't solve the problem because there's so much cat allergen in the environment and it's being circulated around the house a little bit. So I think um, it is difficult and you, you do need, and that's really where the IAQ investigation comes in because if someone says, well, I, I, you know, I have, I, I've just moved into this house, but I don't have a cat or a dog. Well, there's a high probability if you test that, that dust and somebody has been in there before with cats and dogs, that you're going to detect the allergen. And uh, then there's the question of, well, what do you do about it? And, and, uh, and that can, can, can be, um, um, can be helpful in that regard. Now you you sent a couple more slides on recommendations for allergies. Let's let's put number three up there, John. I want to or Grayson. I want to make sure we get through all these. They're they're very good. They're not out of time. Uh, you want to go so, back? Yeah. 
Can you? Yeah. Okay. So this is some of the the best data out there about the clinical efficacy of these kinds of interventions. And the one uh, for your those who are on the podcast, um, the slide on uh, that we have a slide showing the results of a study done by Wayne Morgan, uh, funded by the NIH in two thousand and four. And that really is a landmark study because it showed that if you tailor the intervention towards an al a particular allergen, so if they're cockroach allergic, you do things to get rid of cockroaches. If they're mite allergic, you do different things. And what it showed over a period of, of, of two years was that the people who had the intervention consistently had fewer symptom days throughout that period. So that is really the, in a way, if you like, this was a big study. It was a seminal study from the NIH, and and that was um, that was that was effective. Now the more recent one, um, there was a a single intervention study done a few years ago by. Um, um, Claire Murray and the group in Manchester in England, and they were following up on the idea of can ma can mattress covers be effective for children with asthma? And basically, part of the reason they did this was because in the early 2000s, there were a couple of studies published saying that the mattress covers weren't really effective, uh, in mainly in adults. But in this particular study, what they showed was if you use the mattress covers in children, and the most effective um, uh, responses were in children aged under 11, that there was a 45% less chance of those, those children ending up in the uh, emergency department, which is significant. Because, yeah. as I, you know, if I said before, if, if you can just spend, you can just put mattress covers and you can, you can effectively treat that, then you're saving some of your hundreds of billions of dollars in emergency which is where um, where the economic effect is. Not to mention all the agony those kids go through, huh? Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Grayson. Yeah, so I, I think this is an important one here. Go ahead. Yeah, so I put this up because it, it, it is important to know <clears throat> really what works. And, and we've known for years that... I mean, actually, over a hundred years. That if you if you put asthmatics in what are essentially allergen-free conditions, they will recover. So their lungs get better. They have reduced inflammation. Um, there are natural phenomena where where people used to go to sanatoria in Europe, in in Davos, in Switzerland, and also in the Italian Alps, where they actually do recover um, uh, if they stay there for a few weeks. Um, the other uh, the other area that this has been looked at in the U.S., which is uh, quite topical at the moment with the Oppenheimer movie, is Los Alamos. And years ago, um, um, Tom Platz Mills at UVA did a study there. And what, what the rationale for that study was: look, um, mites don't grow at high altitude. Let's look at what causes asthma or allergy in in in, in the in the children there, because the prevalence was high. And it turns out, yeah, there were no dust mites, but the kids were um, allergic to cats and dogs, which they had, you know, in their homes. And that was the primary um, uh, causation there. The encasings and mattresses we just talked about. But I do think that just to emphasize to everybody here that when when these were first introduced in the 80s and 90s, they were pretty awful. It was like putting your, putting rubber on your bed and sleeping. Yeah. On it, you know, <laughs> yep. you know? Uh, whereas when microfine fat cotton fabrics came along, um, and this was all tested, you could look at fabrics which were, had different um, uh, um uh, gauges on them for the for the pillows uh, for the pillows and 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 the, and the bedding. So if there was a six micron fabric, that really kept out the allergens, um, and it was tested for two microns, six microns, ten microns, and and so on. Um, if you wash bedding, that's good. Um, if you wash cats and dogs, that can help. Reducing humidity um, to around about forty five percent is good. Removing carpets is particularly good, actually, for animal allergens. And then there are obviously some acaricides that you can use for dust mites, um, and as we've discussed, insecticides. I just wanted to point out that, that um, there are various certification programs out there which have become more widely available now. Um, the uh, Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America works with a, a company called Allergy Standards, and they do 
a lot of testing of products. They test things like washing machines and vacuum cleaners and all these uh, appliances, um, and they have specific protocols. And so um, there are other um, agencies, too, that do that. Um, Allergy UK does it in the UK, and there's also another agency, I think, in Europe. So there is a fair amount of... Um, of this kind of product testing, which I think is, is helpful. I think um, one of our regular listeners, I, I noticed he's not on today because I, I think our constant contact didn't go out, but um, Tom Martin com commonly is, is telling us to use these asthma and allergy foundation of America approved products that it, in his experience, as someone who's highly sensitive, he's uh -huh. actually out of work right now because he just can't work in many indoor environments. Um, he swears by these products. So I'm, I'm well, glad you emphasized that. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Um, you know, I was actually over at Allergy Standards, which is actually based in Dublin in Ireland um, 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 last month. And um, they have a, a, a really extensive setup of testing and testing chambers now. They, they've just acquired a company where they have a lot of uh, environmental testing chambers. But we also do testing ourselves at InBio. So we have a an AHAM approved testing chamber at our facility in Cardiff in Wales. Um, and we test an, a lot of products. So we test, you, you know, chemicals or sprays, um, those types of things. And one of the things that we, we do um, both for ourselves and, and we also supply allergy standards with is a dust that has a standard amount of allergens in it. So if you want to test these products, you go into a room and then you can disperse this allergen has a known content of, of mite allergen, cat allergen, dog allergen. And then you can look at the effects on, uh, um, on your particular product or appliance or procedure. Um, and that has been uh, very effective um, in, in, in helping um, uh, manufacturers with their product development. I want to make sure, Cliff, if you want to jump in here, I noticed that one of those points might have caught your attention on the uh, the, the pesticides that were used. No, no. It's, okay. Uh, All right. All right. Just making sure. Thanks. Let's move on to our next one, um, exposure assessment. So for allergens in indoor environments, let's talk a little bit about exposure assessment. Grayson, if you could put up slide five, I think that'll help us kind of cover this topic. Go ahead, Dr. Chapman. Yeah, sure. So traditionally, if you like, we've, we've used reservoir dust samples. Um, we'll talk about the sampling devices in a minute, um, but looking at bedding and carpets because they're primary sources for dust mites, sometimes furnishings as well. Uh, you can collect air samples for animal allergens. Um, a good example of this, for example, is um, when we look at um, uh, uh, laboratory animal al allergy with pharmaceutical companies is that um, we're collecting air samples. We're often using IOM samplers for that. Um, and those are very good for monitoring um, uh, employee exposures to uh, rat and mouse allergens. Um, interestingly, um, you know, we've seen increasing um, um, uh, thoughts, if you like, about using this to monitor um, exposures in cannabis growing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, an assay for cannabis, um, one of the cannabis allergens. Um, it's probably not the right one because our initial experiments haven't yielded great results, but it's certainly something that we're following up on um, with the folks at NIOSH um, because they're interested in health effects, as you might imagine, with all of this indoor growth of, of cannabis, um, releasing a terrific amount of biological material into the environment uh, and exposing employees. And so then um, you send the lab, these samples to the lab analysis by ELISA. Um, we still use ELISA um, the, the, uh, for certain allergens, um, the, the, um, and it's, it's very effective. Um, the, the only question is that when, when we're doing that, we're essentially measuring one allergen at a time. Um, we have developed newer methods for that now, so that they actually we can we can run the ELISA in two hours. We provide uh, um, pre-coated plates and kits to do that. And in fact, we've just developed a new lab for manufacturing these kits because they they used a lot, particularly by allergen manufacturing companies that produce clinical products. So our ELISA reagents are primarily used for that. 
Um, for, and, they, and they're basically, basically used for testing the potency of those extracts. So now we actually have a, um, a robotic system um, called the Hamilton Vantage, which actually will make those ELISA plates for us instead of having to do, you know, hundreds or thousands of plates by hand. And then the Maria I've already mentioned, uh, Maria tends to be more sensitive than ELISA, and that's particularly useful for air sampling. What does Maria stand for, just so we... Yeah, so just it's it's multiplex array for indoor allergens, um, and it, and that was when we first developed that acronym. It was around the time of two thousand eight, two thousand and nine when we first did that, um, and uh, that assay was actually developed for this particular study that you have up on the slide, which was this case study of the National Health Examination and Nutrition Survey. And what I say, this was the last time this was done. This is a nationwide survey within the US. It's a general population survey, and they collect samples of all sorts. They collect blood samples, um, DNA samples, and they look at the health of the entire population in terms of heart risk, diabetes, gastroenterology, uh, GI problems, those kinds of things. And, and this study had a, um, um, an allergy component. And then for the first time, we did allergen testing. And uh, um, um, I'll give a shout out to Maria King, uh, to Eva King, because she uh, um, was involved with the study and uh, uh, really was uh, did a great job. Um, so... Yeah, we so we measured the, the reason that Maria was developed because we had stuff samples from 7,000 homes and we certainly didn't want to do that by Eliza. So these two things kind of came together and we ended up with over 56,000 data points. And what it showed was that the vast majority had home uh, had uh, levels of dust mite, cat and dog allergens in their homes. Some had mouse as well. A surprisingly high percentage, around 16%, had uh, um, detectable levels of seven or more allergens. Um, and then there are a lot of other variables associated with why people would be, um, um, might, which might influence the level of exposure, including race, ethnicity, whether people were poor, poor, um, poor folks, urbanization, and so on. So that was really um, an excellent demonstration of the effectiveness of, of using this particular Maria technology. Great, right, so let's jump to the next slide, try and get one more in before halftime here. Okay, so this was a, another study that's been done um, by uh, Wanda for Botanical um, at Harvard. It's called the Schools Inner City Asthma Study. Um, uh, prior to this study, most of the inner city asthma studies had focused on homes, residential homes, um, uh, single family homes or apartments, apartment buildings and so on. And in this study, um, th they looked at um, elementary schools in the northeastern US. They looked at table wipes, dust samples, um, did a lot of indoor allergen testing, similar to the study I mentioned before. What they found was perhaps not surprising, but mouse was the most common allergen they found in 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 uh, um, um, schools and, and homes, and that the the um, <clears throat> um, higher levels of mouse allergen were found in 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 the in the dust, um, but that correlated with, with what was in the air as well. Hmm. So the the other st the study that I mentioned, the school wide in in, in uh, IPM program. Um, with uh, or using HEPA filter air purifiers, uh, and for, for for whatever reason, did not significantly reduce the symptom days of those <clears throat> of some of those children with asthma. Um, and I think that that's obviously something uh, that that perhaps needs to be followed up. But this is another example of um, how it really is now a, um, a situation where we can actually take this technology. We can provide very. Um, uh, uh, clear outcomes uh, from these studies um, uh, on exposure assessment. Let's. We got one more on this topic, and then we can take a, a I think a little better breaks section. Here. Go ahead, Grayson. Slide us over to number eight. Yeah, you know what I I wanted to. You mentioned earlier IOM sampler, and I wanted you to kind of clarify that for our audience. So this is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, uh, IOM sampler is a personal sampling device that, as you can, uh, it fits on your lapel. It has a pump that goes with it. Um, it samples the air onto a sort of disc, um, about sort of um, two two inches wide, 
um, and it's used for sort of personal sampling. Um, it has a flow rate typically of about two liters a minute. Um, and that's really what is, the, if you like, the gold standard for uh, looking at personal um, exposure. Um, the problem with it is, is that, um, uh, you know, for sampling things like dust mite and cockroach, these things don't stay in the air for very long. Um, whereas other allergens like cat and dog do because they have different aerodynamic properties. So, so yeah. Um, and you've also got the regular dust collector mm -hmm. on here, the, yeah, um, the dust membrane screen. filter cassettes, which I think most of your industrial hygiene folks have used. Yeah. What about the air answers? I'm not, I, I seem to recall that one, but I'm not sure why. Um, it's been developed um, um, by a group in Chicago, um, and they, they, this is a sort of electrostatic type, type of device um, that samples allergens. Um, there is some, there's a published paper on it. Um, um, so that, that has been out there for a couple of years or so. And then the other one that we're looking at there is something called an electrostatic dust collector. This has been used a lot in Europe over the past few years. And basically that is a couple of electrostatic dust sheets that you basically put in a room, um, you leave it for two weeks, and then you come back and then you measure the allergens on it. Let's go to halftime, Grayson. We'll come back with the second half with Dr. Martin Chapman in just a moment. Our association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA's multidisciplinary membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at EIA-USA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Actionable insights, no more mistakes, no more missed line items in your Xactimate estimates at getinsights.org. Industry sponsors are Particles Plus, feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. BioPlanet at byoplanet.com, improving human, animal, and environmental health with electrostatic spray technology and advanced chemistries at biobyoplanet.com. Actionable insights at getinsights.org. We're back with the second half of our interview. We've got Dr. Martin Chapman. We're talking about allergens and IEQ. All right, let's go, Grayson. Put up slide number nine. Um, InBio has come up with a new air sampling strategy here, I guess we'll call it. And um, I want to first talk about with you, Dr. Chapman, what are some of the challenges of doing air sampling for allergens? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, Joe. Um, um, the issues uh, for the longest time are these allergens have different aerodynamic properties. So, for example, a lot of the dust mite allergen is in the mite feces. They're about 10 to 40 microns in diameter. And if you disturb, if you're if they're present in dust or on beds, typically typically they only stay in the air about 20 to 40 minutes. Um, similarly for cockroach allergen, although we're not really quite sure what the actual particle uh, for that is. Um, in cat and dog, we're looking at shed um, cat dander. Um, the the allergen is is um, secreted either through the skin or the salivary glands. It coats these part these dander particles, and they tend to stay airborne for several hours. And so they're more amenable generally to air sampling, and they're usually present at much more higher levels. So one of the problems with air sampling has been that. You know, in order to do it, you, you see folks who go into buildings and they have a whole bag full of pumps and they plug stuff in and it makes a lot of noise. It's not very convenient. Um, and it's also, you know, it's a challenge for, you know, the IAQ guy has to have it in his truck or whatever. It, it, um, whereas the new device um, 
actually developed out of a master's student project in the UK. We we have another part of our company in the UK in Cardiff, Wales. And um, it was he, he basically uh, it was an engineering student and he, he, he actually 3D printed the first one, which is on that slide there right at the back. This is a sort of, you know, progression or evolution of the uh, collector that we developed. So it's a sampler. The key feature of this sampler is it doesn't make any noise. Um, and um, it's also a high volume sampler too. So the idea is that the 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 um, um, air is drawn through the device uh, onto a filter, which is about two to three inches square. Uh, and then after that, you can pull out the filter and um, 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 measure the allergen on it. Um, typically, we sample with this for about seven days, but you can get results in as little as 24 hours. And uh, Dr. Maria Oliver in the UK um, has uh, presented this a couple of weeks ago at the American Allergy Meeting, where there was a lot of interest. Um, um, you know, if you want to put a, a device like this into a child's bedroom, you can go ahead and do that. It doesn't it, it, it doesn't make any noise. It just sits there on the top of a shelf or something. Um, we currently have been testing it in in uh, in Hackney, East London, which is a low income area, and I'm actually working with Dr. Adnan Kustovic and have detected quite a lot of mouse allergen in in those in those cases. Um, we're also working with a, um, um, a department of uh, occupational health and hygiene in Germany um, with uh, Dr. Monica Ralph Heimsoff, and she is testing several devices now and as enthusiastic. Actually, if you if you want to just, I can show you this. I have one on my desk here, yeah. uh, just to give you an example. So this is it, and you can sort of see it fits in my hand. That gives you an idea of how how big this thing is. This is what it looks like from the side, and then if you pull this up you can actually see the filter material that's inside here. So this is actually what comes back to the lab and is what sort of what we test for. So um, um, that's the device. Um, and I think, you know, we're excited about this uh, partly because um, um, it's unobtrusive. Um, you can put it in a school classroom. Um, you can put it in an office if you want to test whether somebody's exposed to things. Um, and it's it's really also a little bit less, you know, a lot of people, when you go into a home and you want to, add, you say, I want to vacuum your dust. And a lot of people sort of, you know, and they're not entirely comfortable with that. Whereas I think they get like, if you if you say, okay, I'm just going to put this, this device here, it's just going to sample the air for a few days. It's just a less intrusive way of doing the sampling, and you know we don't know yet. We have preliminary data that I can sh I can show some results that I can show you, but um, we know that it can it measures allergens. It can use be used to be, to measure endotoxin, which is a bacterial product and um, that is often tested for. So you know I think that um, we're, we're but there's a lot lot more testing to be done. But we're we're certainly excited about the way this product is developing. What what type of filter is that? I didn't. I couldn't. It look it doesn't yeah. look like an MCE. It's almost see through. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's called a a, a, um, a polypropylene mesh filter, and and that's all I'm allowed to tell you about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'll get killed. <laughs> so, so, so. Understood. Cliff. So, so yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, if 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 I may. Doctor, um, you know, as this device would be, I guess, taken from place to place, different homes and so on and so forth, is there some sort of cleaning process that occurs in between or do you replace the fan or or, or what happens? So that no, I, I think probably what we would recommend is it's really it's really the filter. Um, I mean, you could wipe the surface of it with a, a regular wipe. Um, um, we've not particularly had problems with that. And the filters, of course, are all kept in, in plastic bags and you just swap them straight in and out. And so um, that's typically the way it's been used. And I guess I'm, I'm still trying to picture in my mind here the exposure route. So it, it appears to me that most of the allergy and asthma related issues that come from being, you know, exposed to allergens is from inhalation exposure. And for years, we've always just measured dust because, well, I guess the IOMs have been around for a while too, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. They've been. Um, I, I'm not quite sure when they were first introduced, but it, it's it's a way a way back. So this is an improve. This is a way of doing an area sample of air as opposed to a personal sample of air. Yeah, it's it's not. It, it's almost like a sort of substitute for for a um, um, a personal sampler. Um, the advantage is that you know with samples at about 500 liters a minute, we've tested this with a with a uh, you know a calibrated instrument, and so if you've got a, um, I mean you know the my office here is about what I don't know 170 square feet or something, you could calculate the air volume in there, um, but within um, I would you know if you're sampling at that rate then. We could look at how quickly you could sample essentially the whole air air, air in the room, um, um, which you know is what is is what you can do. And especially if you are going to run this for days, then you, you know it, 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 it's there are two things: it's the 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 volume, the high volume sampler, the collection onto a much larger filter, and when you couple that with um, our Maria uh, testing for allergens, which is very sensitive, it increases the sensitivity of the whole system. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Grace, let's go to the next slide. I, I, I don't recall, but I think we were on yeah. nine or 10. Yeah. So this slide actually it just shows you a comparison of the samples collected after 12 hours of different allergens. Now, this is not only indoor allergens, but it also includes some peanut allergens, for example, which are ROH3 and ROH6, some egg allergen, which is the GALD2, and milk allergen, which is the BOSD5. And we don't need to worry too much about the others, but you can see that we're looking at 10 to 100 fold more sensitivity on the Apollo versus the Institute of Medicine sampler. So, you know, we were very encouraged by this, uh, um, um, the way this was developing. And uh, if you look at the next slide, can we go to the next one? Um, so if you just give it another click, then, um, so on the left there, um, you see the comparison again with the Institute of Medicine sampler. So the IOM sampler, as we suggest, as I said, I said earlier, was good for detecting cat and dog. Um, and we got similar results with the um, Apollo air sampler. Um, but when we're looking at dust mite or mouse, the um, air sampler was much better. Um, and you can see from this is that typically what you find is that the, the amount of allergen is 10 to 100 fold higher for, for cat and dog as compared to the others. And then the other comparison on the right there is with the electrostatic dust collector. Um, and you can see with that, that we were getting much better um, data for dust mite, cat, dog, and mouse with the um, air sampler as opposed to the static um, 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 electrostatic device. So, um, you know, um, and, and then, um, yeah, so we can stop there and then I can show you the endotoxin data if you have any questions. Let me quick uh, ask you a question. We've had Dr. David Miller on the show quite a few times and we, uh, one of the shows in particular we talked about um cockroach uh, no i'm sorry dust mite allergen and he was explaining to us that it's now found all over the place i mean just just all over the place is that the same experience you found in the lab that more and more places and more and more locations is are now you know uh finding well, dust mite I guess I would say if you look back at the studies that we've done, that we've we've never had any real issues in detecting dust mite in bedding, for example, and, and, and other places. I, I guess I'd need to know kind of precisely where um, David Miller was saying it, it is now that it wasn't then, so to speak. But uh, um, I mean, dust mite is probably the most important allergen worldwide in terms of causing sensitization. And we know now a lot more, for example, we know that if you develop allergic responses to two or three particular allergens in the first year or two of life, th that is predictable of whether uh, you're gonna develop asthma later on. And mm -hmm. so if you if you look at exposure, uh, at, 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 at people becoming allergic to what's called derpy one or derpy two or something called derpy 23, those are key allergens that are associated with asthma development. Um, um, so it, it, it is, you know, we, do, we know we know a lot more about this. And in fact, in, in our own 
um, uh, real structural biology studies, we've been able to identify recently uh, using um, some new reagents called um, um, a human IgE monoclonal antibodies, we can actually map exactly what these allergic antibodies are, are binding to on the surface of the allergen, which is actually very exciting from the point of view of developing new types of therapy. So there's a lot going on in that area. And Eva jogged my mind here. David Miller discussed the increased geographic distribution of dust mites. Uh, you said it so much better than me, Eva. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but I think that uh, I mean uh, that that's a consequence really of of uh, um, studies being done all over the world in more more and more countries. Uh, I mean, if you look at places like China and Korea, Singapore, um, um, you know. That is a very interesting case because the people there have incredibly high levels of antibodies to uh, dust mites, but there haven't been that many studies of actually the levels in Singapore apartments and things. Um, but it, it certainly is likely to be present there in places like Hong Kong. So yeah, I, I you know I think that that's um, um, definitely true. Grayson, so let's jump over to slide twelve. That that's the last one in this section about air sampling. Yeah, so this is really just to show that we can we can measure um, uh, this bacterial product called endotoxin, um, which is also associated with the uh, um, can be associated with asthma, both in terms of uh, in prevention from asthma if you're exposed to a lot of endotoxin in early life, and the 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 the, the levels of endotoxin in dust are often associated associated with people having pets, and so. That's what this slide shows. It's a mixture of samples from the US and UK. And you can see, we can first of all, we can de readily detect the endotoxin on the um, Apollo filters. And the levels in houses with pets are, are an order of magnitude higher than houses with no pets. Um, and so this is something that we're, we're following up on. So we're, we're excited about the Apollo. Um, we, we think it's going to have a more broad spread application. They're doing testing now in the UK in conjunction with a, um, a, a research fellow at Cardiff Metropolitan University where we're looking at um, bacteria and fungal exposures. So they're going to be looking for aspergillus. Um, for um, um, MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph, um, for Klebsiella and Listeria, so and as well as bacteriophages. And so, what we're really looking here is look, you know, given the um, um, importance of um, virus exposure now that we know uh, that we're very much more uh, cognizant of with the uh, pandemic and everything. Can we use this device as a simple uh, measure for looking at um, uh, viruses and, and so on, which would be terrific if we could do that. Now, endotoxin, is, does that affect allergies and asthma? Or is that more of an indicator of something that may affect it? <clears throat> no, it can definitely, I mean, you know, the, the farming studies that have been done in Europe, where there's a low prevalence of sensitization and asthma among farmers, have been heavily linked to endotoxin exposure. So if you're exposed to high levels of endotoxin, it shifts the immune response from one that's basically pro-allergic to one that is, is, is uh, uh, I hesitate to say, say anti-allergic, but it, it, it is more controls a different kind of immune response, which does not result in the development of allergies. So um, that's really the parameter, the, the, the rationale for, for looking at it. But also, you know, you can look at this as an, a bacterial exposure in, in manufacturing processes and plants and so on. Um, it, it, it could be, for example, useful in looking at the, uh, the uh, cannabis uh, scenario that we were talking about earlier, because if if there's a lot of uh, bacteria in this product, then we could we could actually detect it. And the problem is that if you inhale it, and it can cause inflammation, and and so um, you you really don't want to be ex exposed to high levels of this. Let's go to a little bit. Of, I think we've got a slide thirteen on how the IEQ investigator determines what type of analysis they should ask for when they're doing these assessments. Can you talk to our listeners a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the question is, what is the role of the IAQ specialist, uh, the industrial hygienist in, in allergen exposure assessment? Um, we think that it, you know, we should be looking at uh, how that how I, I, IAQ can can work with this. I mean, you mentioned earlier the um, uh, Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City and and Kevin Kennedy and the work they've been doing, and that is a really good example of IAQ um, um, people working in conjunction with the allergy community to to look at exposure in homes and say how can we improve this and they they've actually been very successful i think in getting insurance to cover some of the costs and so the, the this is what we're looking at here that we we really want um, to try to strengthen that relationship to to look at allergen exposure so if 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 someone's called into a home and they say well look my 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 child's been in the emergency room a couple of times then the the idea is well let's let's take a look at what what you might be exposed to that's causing that problem uh, which which could in many cases be allergens um and and it's interesting you know we we uh, we can we wrote a couple of reviews last year about this that there's one element of the um, um health of the um uh, um the uh, Ob obamacare healthcare program was that um if you were um admitted to an emergency room for a couple of times, then you would qualify um, through Medicaid services for a home inspection or a home assessment and to see what, what whether that was contributing. Um, and I think our approach to that is that there, there's not really any data looking at um, how effective these assessments are versus the actual allergen exposures. But we really think that it would be great if the CDC or um, you know, HUD could actually look at that and see what additional what what that relationship is, and and obviously we believe that make, making the actual allergen measurements would be an improvement. Um, and again, so you know, this the rest of the slide is really summarizing that we can get good data using either Eliza or Maria. And that the multiplex technology, you know, if we wanted to study a hundred homes in a particular area. I mean, this is often the case where public housing is in bad can bad shape, and and people find cockroaches, mouse, and sometimes rats. And uh, while a lot of that is visible, it's not all visible. And so, if you wanted to look at a housing complex um, or you know commercial real estate and say, you know, what are we looking at here? Then the Maria technology is, is, is great for, for that application. I think, Joe, is, is that the other thing that we've noticed over the past few years, at least, is that there's also been an increase in, in people wanting to look at food allergens in homes, and um, particularly things like peanut milk and egg, um, because that home exposure is, is, is being related to some development in food allergy. Um, and as you know, food allergy has increased in the U.S. over the past 10, 20 years. So we now have um, um, a multiplex array for food allergens, which we call Maria for Foods. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been using that a lot. Not that we've done some home testing, but we, it, it's mainly been used to, to, to measure um, food allergens uh, that are being used or are, are recommended for food allergic patients or their children to actually take. So that's another application of this particular technology. All right, the roundups. Uh, Cliff, let me make sure I get a, give you a chance to jump in, ask any final questions you have. Well, I guess your memory uh, is better than mine when, in regards to who said what. But one of our guests, I remember uh, in regards to asthma, uh, saying that it, you know, if you have a young kid, get him a dog. Do you remember that, Joe? Yeah, that was Jeff Siegel. Jeff Siegel, <laughs> right. And, and I think that that probably uh, confirms what Martin said in terms of you know, reducing asthma in children, because it seems like uh, the same thing maybe in farmers, or, or would it be something different, Martin? Yeah, no, I, but I think it depends on when you give them the dog or the cat, actually. There is some data that if you expose kids to high levels of, of cat allergen, or if they have a cat in the first year or two of life, it prevents the sensitization later on through a, a, an immunological phenomenon that we call tolerance. Um, and there is the NIAID is doing more studies on that. 
and they're particularly trying to see whether there are particular strains of bacteria produced by these animals and pets um, that could actually be responsible for it. So it's a very high priority area. Thank you. You know, another real hot topic lately is these low cost sensors for total VOCs, for CO2, <clears throat> for particles. And, you know, you can get one for two, three hundred dollars, maybe less even that you can have in your home or travel around with. What's the outlook for those types of low cost you know, sensors in, in the allergy world? Um, it's, I would say that, it, um, it's, it's, um, there's no, nothing immediately on the horizon. I think the problem is that when you're looking at chemical detection, it's a whole lot easier to develop this sensor technology. And the problem then comes when you're talking about allergens, which are larger biological molecules, protein molecules, it becomes more difficult to actually do that. I mean, there are, there are companies working on that, but I've not seen anything out there that's really reliable to do it because if we could find something like that, we would want to license it. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, that's kind of uh, um, work. But you do see reports that now and again of things, especially coming out of places like Taiwan and China, uh, where they seem to be be doing that kind of work. But we've we've not we've not seen anything that we could really um, um, w that we really like up to this point. You know, I just saw an article in that these folks are, I think, fairly close to you down at the University of Virginia. Um, they were working on some kind of low cost sensor that would detect viruses. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, that could be Virginia Tech, actually. Virginia Tech, there's, yes. There's somebody there who's doing a lot of work. She was interviewed a lot on the uh, on the COVID story and everything. And definitely we'd be interested in looking at that. What you would probably be detecting would be the viral DNA by PCR-based techniques and things. And that is a very, very sensitive um, way of doing it. And that may be an approach that we also try to use with Apollo at some point. Interesting. Before we go, is there anything we missed that you'd like to add? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things going on at the moment. I think the big thing, um, um, John McKeon at Allergy Standards has been involved in developing um, a, a nonprofit called the Indoor Air Innovation and Research Institute, or IAIR. Um, and they're really trying to look at this thing holistically from the point of view of, look, we want to develop healthy buildings. And um, uh, they're working with um, uh, companies that are into this. They, they, they had a reception at the Daikin Sustainability Center in, in DC a couple of weeks ago, which a couple of our colleagues, uh, Beatty Sturgill, who's on this call, went to. And they're really trying to encourage cleaner air in homes, in buildings, in offices, and trying to get stakeholders together. And so I think that's, you know, that at this meeting, they had the former U.S. Surgeon General there, um, um, uh, and Jerome Adams is his name. And he was basically saying that they tried to do this in, in the previous um, administration, not the Trump, but the previous administration with Obama. And, and really, um, he had to convince people that this was economically going to pr produce the goods. And basically, they had evidence that productivity was improved into these circumstances. Um, and I guess that if you, you improve the hair, hair for kids, that they're going to feel better at school and so on. And so I think this is a real push to try to, you know, get get stakeholders together to look at the quality of indoor air and uh, improve people's lives. And that was pre-COVID. Now with COVID, there's even more interest. So their timing might be perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is why, why they're moving ahead with this. Dr. Martin Chapman, thank you so much. It's great to have you back. And uh, next time we won't make it, what, 14 years or whatever, <laughs> 16 years. But uh, we appreciate you joining us. It's been a pleasure, Joe. Thanks a lot. And, uh, all right. This all is Radio best. Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Dr. Martin Chapman, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick. Grayson had a rough day at the controls. <laughs> <laughs> Grayson got it gone fishing Fisher. Um, next week, we're going to do a memorial show for a dear friend of ours who passed last weekend, Maid Dooley. Um, we're going to put together an old show we did with her, but we're going to add a bunch of photos of May. So uh, we look forward to having you join us to 
uh, celebrate the life of a, a real Bob biology and uh, IEQ investigator that uh, just gave her all. So we appreciate that. We'll see you next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening. 